pre-panel. I do hope there's enough room for you guys up there. I know. Sheesh. I don't know. <laughs> I left my ego at home. Normally, my ego wouldn't fit. This is my comic book. It's actually an anthology of my stories, so it's really more of a collection of short stories. Um, Fifteen dollars called Horror Streets. So it's a, a horror comic book. Um, my name is Jeff Carroll, and welcome to the Monster Panel. One, two. Okay. Right, right. We it's do. Sunday morning. You gotta have them. Yes, yeah, Sunday morning. Very good. <laughs> Kanye West is gonna jump in here any minute and give us a little Sunday morning service. <laughs> um, my name is Jeff Carroll. I'm a science fiction writer, filmmaker, and a comic book man. Um, and I uh, put this uh, style of panel together to mimic uh, the lively panel at Comic Con uh, that Michael Davis does called the. Uh, Black panel, um, and we did the South Florida version. So normally we have women. Normally we have we have more than just uh, two guys up here talking. Um, but the goal of this is to not talk as about writing, not necessarily talk about the process of writing. This is more like talk to writers, right? Listen to how writers talk about various different things. And of course, today we're going to be talking about um, comic books. We're going to be talking about horror, writing horror, uh, the stories that are out there. And um, I have an illustrious guest with me. It's actually probably been his third time. Is this the third time or the second time? Third. Third time being on the Monster Panel. He's, he's a resident of the area of Orlando. So this is a hometown boy. I come, I come from South Florida um, by way of New Jersey. So um, Marcus? Would you like to introduce yourself and put your uh, comic book up, lean it on the mic or something, so that way the people in the virtual, yeah, 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 so they can see, all right? Tell them who you are and then we can get started. Hey, well, my name is Marcus Roberts. I am a freelance writer, uh, comic book creator. I initially started in the comic book community a few years back writing articles, doing interviews, and writing character biographies and whatnot for a website called World of Black Heroes. And then by doing interviews and meeting the various comic book creators, uh, I would always ask, get asked the question, uh, you ever thought about doing a comic book? And uh, my answer was always, yeah, I think about it every day. I'm a long, I'm what they call a generational comic book. In other words, like my father read comic books. His, all of his relatives read comic books, and they passed that down to me. Uh, my first comic books were war comic books. The, our Army at War and Sergeant Rock and Easy Company. You know, I grew up with that type of stuff. And there was some horror comic books in there, but the period in which I was, in which I grew up, we were still under the comic books. Cold authority, and if you aren't familiar with that, they were the stranglehold on comics. 
So there were different, you didn't see a lot of horror mainstream so much, but you did see it was still there. Well, thank you very much. We're going to jump around, right? Um, has everybody seen this movie, The Joker? No, I'm sorry. You haven't seen it? Not yet. How about you? Oh my God, we can't talk about The Joker yet? You saw it? Technically, the spoilers were already given on the internet. Nobody cared. Yeah, technically, it's not spoilable because we already know who the Joker is. It's not like he's Brightburn and we don't know who the heck he is. Um, but uh, Cesar Romero, right? Excuse me? Joker, Cesar Romero, right? Yeah, right. So there we go. Uh, we've seen this. So what would be spoilers is just really just uh, a particular interpretation of, of the Joker. But what I will say about it now, without you know spoiling it specifically, is to say that it is a game changer. You know, um, in the sense that you can't help but go on social media and hear a spoiler because people are talking about it. You had uh, um, Martin Scorsese who uh, made the Heat, he made Taxi Driver, and you know he kind of pioneered a brand of realistic. Violence. He, I wouldn't say pioneer because there were so many people doing violent stories in the 70s. It's just that he made some iconic films in that time period. And since on, and, you know, made some good hit, hit or miss stuff throughout his film career. So he's definitely a noteworthy filmmaker. But um, this film is sort of a, a, a monkey wrench in his condemnation of superhero movies. And um, what I like about it is that it blends horror. It blends horror in a very real way, different than the Heath Ledger version of, of, of Joker. Um, you, did you see uh, Jessica Jones' Kilgrave, the first season? Um, did you see Brightburn? Yeah. All right, we can still, you guys saw Brightburn? I'm okay with it. I haven't seen it, but I'm okay with discussing it. Don't worry about it. Yes, don't worry. I mean, <laughs> first of all, and, and Brightburn also was a comic book too, so it's, it's, it's a different. Um, and you saw Carrie, the, the classics. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, when, not specifically the joke, but what do you think about the realistic violence that has made its way from the horror genres of Carrie to the superhero genres? like Brightburn and Jessica Jones. What do you think about that? I think uh, because comics are aimed at audiences, at certain audiences, because comics do have an aim that eventually it had to happen. Because as we become more mature, as we as, we, as people become more smarter, we become more knowledgeable, we are less afraid of the boogeyman. Uh, I was talking with uh, one of the vendors who's Kerry Craig, who does, uh, who does photography, and he photographs cemeteries. And we're talking about images and talking about how in growing up, you know, the graveyards were a scary thing. But as you got older, you realized a lot. The people who were alive were more scary than people who were dead. So, with a basis like that, you incorporate that into comics and films, uh, Brightburn specifically, we were talking about uh, as scary as it was, there was a comic book series that came out around 2005 called Supreme Power. And in the Supreme Power comic book series, you had uh, an alien child come to Earth who was actually raised by the, didn't have superheroes in, in, in this Earth. And he was found and raised by the military complex. So he had strict and staunch discipline. So uh, he acted out growing up here and there, but because of the strict and staunch discipline, it didn't get out of bounds. Well, you look at Brightburn, he was raised by a farmer and a hippie. So he was raised to be a hippie. He was raised to, you know, not keep himself in check, his emotions in check. So you would expect him, once he hit puberty and has these conflicting things going on, to act on his uninhibitedness 
So, so let me ask you a question. Are you saying that hippies raise mass murderers? Uh, no, actually I'm saying that in the film Bright Burn, and I call the person a hippie, she's not actually a hippie. She was nice looking. Dude. I'm she, down she, she wasn't actually a hippie. Wasn't actually a hippie. Uh, she was a liberal artist. She was, so, you think, uh, she was, so you're saying the case for Bright Burn is the fact that he was raised with a liberal family and wasn't raised in the military? Look at it. I, I, I hate to skip around, but if you look at the beginnings of Superman, because of where Superman landed and because of who he was raised by, his initial story, in his initial stories, he was fighting against uh, tax collectors, revenues, the banks, these people. Right. Because the people that raised him, those were actually their enemies. Ma and Pa, Ken, you know, they lived on the farm, so they had to deal with tax people. They had to deal with crooked banks. So they what does that say about so, Brightburn? Does it say that um, his parents' morals overlap? Because I saw it as a different. I saw it differently. I saw his parents being nice. His father didn't even have anger issues. His father was a, 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 a what do you call it? When, when he was in the pool room, he broke up the fight. You know what I'm saying? He was almost anti anti violence. And then for his son to come out so violently responsive, I mean, he, he didn't become overtly violent until after he had defended himself and got a taste of it. But I don't see the connection between his family values and, and, and say, his values. And then I'll still bring it back to, you know, what's going on to the superhero genre. But go ahead, respond to that. The family values are important because you think about think about uh, let me go back to someone like Ed Gein. Are, are you all familiar with who Ed Gein is? Uh, Ed Gein is the person whom the original Psycho story was based on. Uh, now, if you look at Ed using him as a case Alfred study, Hitchcock, son. Yeah. yeah. You, Using him as a case study, uh, it was his upbringing, coupled with his own mental deterioration, his own uh, mental sickness, for lack of a better way to describe it. But the upbringing is that made him become what he became. Uh, now I can see that. I see that, and actually, when you see the Joker, it plays more like Carrie, and you can see Carrie lashing out much more than Brightburn. Because with Brightburn, I think the goal was to show that it was a nice guy. I mean, nice family, he was loved, but there was something alien in him that made him flip over the other side. I think you need to read Supreme Power. If, any, if you haven't read this comic book series, you need to read Supreme Power. Because with the Supreme, in the Supreme Power series, the character Hyperion, and we still see Hyperion appear in the comic books today. But Hyperion is an alien. He came from another planet. And even in the description as him coming to the planet, it talked about how the ship he was in would sing to him and talk to him. He was receiving the message of being, message of being implanted into as him an as an infant. Same as Superman, right? Same as Superman. And from what we see from Brightburn, same as Brightburn, because his ship kept telling him, take over the world. Right, and that's part of the world. That's probably where Brightburn got it from more so than say his parents upbringing. But back to the to the, to the thing, you were getting to the point where you, you were touching on the uh, the energy uh, or the audience of comic books. And as much as you know, superheroes save the world. Um, even when you see somebody who is a uh, a straight Freddy Krueger like Wolverine who's cutting people open, arms are flying everywhere. We didn't see the bloody violence that we see in horror movies, like Carrie, blood flashing and flying on the screen. I'll tell you, take, take Freddy Krueger, even the, 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 the cheesy ones or whatever, those horror movies, that energy was never really brought to a superhero, um, a, a superhero story. Do you think it is, a, is good? Like, um, they were debating this 
you know, Joker got an R rating. I think a lot of that was just marketing. But take for some, something like Kill Greg, where he's he's killing it. He's doing some real mess of things. And even with Brightburn, do you think that is good for superhero movies to have the blood that you saw in Brightburn, where he's mutilated the lady, you know, when he came in the house? Do you think that's good? Or is that, you know, superheroes are not supposed to have that type of blood in country? How do you feel about that? I think it's the natural progression of things compared to it. We have to root in the boys. I don't know if you all saw the... the yes. Mm -hmm. What is it? Not AMC. Uh, Amazon. Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. And then we have to bring in watch. Now, even with Take, take the Boys, um, um, uh, Homelander, he was brutal, but he wasn't Jessica Jones brutal. You understand what I'm saying? He flipped somebody in the air, they came back, he was comedic. When I'm talking carry, I'm he, talking he about. He had a pathology to his brutality. Yeah, regardless of how, why he was killing, the killer, 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 killer pulling his chest kid. open, all the type of stuff that, you know, when, when if he was to burn you with his eyes, in to the, the next phase, if it was like the if it was like the Joker, or if it was like Carrie, you would see the molten skull. You know, you would see some real good special effects. You know, bubbling, popping, and pussing. You know, all coming out. I don't know. I, I to, to answer my own question, um, I don't know if I want to see a real brutal Tom and Jerry. You know, <laughs> a blood and gut. Because there's something that I'm, uh, I, and and blood. Much as we're evolving, blood has always been around. Heck, blood and guts was around before film. That's why they had to have ratings in the first place, was to put some limits on how much realism you wanted to show in, in film. And I, I think when you have somebody like Martin Scorsese, who is saying that, you know, uh, 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 horror, I mean, superhero stories are not film and not entertaining. I think they keep trying to prove that they are and um, are, are encroaching on the horror genre. And I don't have a problem with horror uh, superhero stories, but I don't need them to totally all become that. You know what I'm saying? Because I like Endgame. I like the Avengers. I like soft blood and killing. Focus on the action. But when it starts to go down that path, when, when do we start? We, we're going to have Hellraiser, uh, uh, X-Men, you know, and it's going to be that gory? Yes, you had a question. Do, do you think that, uh, first of all, I agree with you. I think the superhero movies are, the reason people go to the movies in the first place are for escapism and to escape the reality of there life. There you go. But do you think that the reason that they're upping the ante with the horror and the gore and the graphic is because the superhero market is so saturated now and there's so much out, they have to do something else to get that shock value and draw people into the theater? I, I think so, but I think it's more over the DC Marvel battle, okay. and they could not beat DC uh, Marvel with the fun action Chris Evans, you know DC, Samuel Jackson. DC type. needs to take their writers from TV and do their movies instead. I mean, <laughs> right, right. You know, so I think they felt failure in Justice League. I think Aquaman didn't make it. Aquaman wasn't Black Panther. You know Wonder, what I'm Wonder Woman was. I mean, I, uh, which one? Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman was. She Wonder was actually the better than Miss Marvel. Carried DC on his on her back, pretty much. Right. And I and I and I don't think they realized it. And um, they have Batman. When they did Heath Ledger, that Batman. But again, they went with Midget Bane, and they messed <laughs> up. You know, because what happened was they clowned the Bane. They didn't take the villain serious. You know, and Bane is a real. He is the Joker. And that's right. The mask was the same. Yeah, he he could have stayed, stayed the same, the exact same uh, size he was, as long as he had the mask. But without the mask that you identify Bane with, oh, with the, 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 the 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 stuff yeah. being pumped yeah. in him, and then him growing. You know, they could they had the CGI. In. Yes. To, to comment on that, I actually agree with you on that. Firstly, throughout the movie, I was like, I can accept this Bane. I can accept this Bane. But the second the scene came out where he was just another puppet or minion to the oh, assassin, I was like, they completely ruined his character. 
And he wasn't min he lost his menace. Once he becomes a sidekick, he's not threatening anymore. Now, if he had been two villains that, oh my God, these that two villains together. are partnering up, now it's like, oh shoot, it's like Godzilla going up against two different monsters. Now you're that like, oh shoot. That name returned, you know, Catwoman, Penguin, and and uh, um, and, and two, don't you face up, boy. The real one. No, that was uh, two things. No, it was um, oh, it, it was just Catwoman and, and Penguin, but um, uh, Catwoman. Christopher Walken was technically a villain, but and, not really. I think also to that point, you're what illustrating it, there. There is. I like. I remember watching Daredevil, and I was like, how are they going to explain him giving his name? You know, and the kid shouted it out and said it different than the way he got it in even Frank Miller's comic book. And it made so much sense, so much more sense that sometimes it's like, when I write my books, because I write novels, uh, I read my lines out loud. Sometimes it's important to do that, to hear how it sounds. You know, and a lot of comic books don't always directly translate to uh, live action, specifically the costumes, you know. Um, women aren't kicking in five inch heels and running down the street. That just has to, you know, that's fanboy art. And maybe she can, you know, um, have that image. I like the way they did it in Watchmen, where they said, you know, that's what everybody thinks of us. But in reality, this is how we have to be. And um, the, even the costumes, they might have to be tweaked to become more explained because, um, you know, like when I do my writing class, I tell everybody, take out a role-playing game sheet. If you've ever played a role-playing game, you know, you know that every weapon, every piece of clothing has a significance, has a meaning, has a damn origin. You understand what I'm saying? And once your character gets that weapon, that outfit, those shoes, those glasses, he is, or she, is changed in that game because they add something to you. So you don't have anything just for visual. It's yellow for a reason. Do you follow the DC TV shows? Not all of them. So I, 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 I mean, you know what? Yeah, I should have jumped on the Arrowverse, but I came in and out of Flash. Supergirl, though, this season, just that. You know, now she's got a more similar costume to Superman, but she's got the, the pants and, and, and a more practical costume that makes sense than, you know, flying around with a skirt and a cape. It's, right. It's, it's, you know, it's, so they, they are kind of moving in that direction, but not enough. Even though, you know, the man in you probably liked her legs. I, I like six and one half dozen. I, I, you know, I, I, what I've actually enjoyed with the DC um, TV is, is the uh, references to the other universes and the, and the end jokes. The best show out of all those, I think, is Legends of Tomorrow. There are a bunch of misfits, but the, all the jokes and references to all the other comic book, Flash did it too. Flash did a really good job of tying in the, the universe. Uh, the, the other DC comic, uh, Legends and Lore, even in just passing comments. I, will, I, was, I was trying to watch something. Let me get him and then I'll come to you. Yeah, sure. All right, well, I'm going to back up some and uh, go back to the, the horror aspect with, within the superhero genre. And I'm going to, I'm going to say, because, and I point this out because of how we as readers evolve. But something else we need to factor in that we always totally overlook is who is currently writing. Now, you take the people who are currently writing and you look at where they came from and what was around, then you'll, you'll see where there's a desensitization that has occurred uh, with our kids now in the talked about this years ago, 30 years ago I remember hearing, we are desensitizing our kids' violence to gore, to blood because of video games. And you had its proponents and opponents. But we see now, because of some of the material that's out, that our kids not only go watch, but in the, the movies, the video games, in our reading, because there has been a desensitization over society, about issues like this, like the horror, for example, blood. It was shocking to see blood and care. It's expected to see it now. Their lives are different. 
what one you generation accepts, possibly accepts the other embraces. But but then then there's the whole Annabelle series in Insidious, and they don't have the glory of Hellraiser. Yeah. You know, as much and I, I'm a Gemini, so I always see both sides of the sub, you know, issue. But there is lanes for the gore porn, right? There's definitely lanes for it. But then there's others that totally defy that. Insidious is like going on the 19th Insidious, and there's nothing but cheap. Well, I'm gonna say cheap, but camera tricks that keep you going. Drag scene in every movie. You know, the, the jump, who was there? And that's really all they have, and I love it. I thought to see it with my son, you know, but I still like, I'm like, when are they gonna bring Dawn of the Dead back? You know what I'm saying? When I think they you had to my point, though, that because of the desensitization of seeing gore, of seeing blood, of seeing limbs chopped off, because that's not scary anymore, then you have to do something on a more psychological basis. Well, then we will revert, revert away from that, you know what I'm saying? So that's fine, but at least now we know that we've been inoculated, if there's a way to say it, towards the blood, and if it has to be in the movie, it has to be well-deserved, right? It has to be um, a direct, and it's not necessarily expected. It has to be explained, and it's not shock value anymore. It has to be necessary. Go ahead, your point, and then I got you. Yeah, um, to go back to the whole to actually also to add on to your decentralization. It's also the, so, there's also the belief that um, the whole fact that they add gore, gore, blood, and all this is them, most creators being lazy about it. Like they just want to add it there to say, yeah, this is also a bloody movie. Right, right, right. But, That's what I felt with the, with the Joker, you know. The true horror, like the things that terrified me were movies like Sinister, Jaws, or Deep Blue Sea, and it wasn't, uh, yeah, Alien, Alien as right. well, and it wasn't the whole, cool. no, it was the atmosphere, it was the creature, it was the fact that, yes, I feel in danger if I was in these people's shoes. I agree with you on Jaws, that's still probably my most scariest movie. Alien comes in there, but only the first Alien, the second Alien, second Alien 2 is my favorite, but it's not scary like the first one. Get out of here, you bitch! That's uh, not the tone. So it's, it's not just um, our comics I mean, and, and uh, superheroes. I think one of the films that may have opened the door to the gore, although they did it effectively and for a reason to show the horrors of war, Saving Private Ryan. Mm. And that was extremely mm. graphic, but it was for, it had a purpose and a reason to be there, because war is literally hell. I mean, you, but then now, Filmmaker says, Oh, look, Saving Private Ryan did good with all this in there. Let me put this in my movie so my movie will do well. And then it just perpetuates on where everyone has to top one another with, with, with more and more in it. And, and, and to what you were saying, I agree that the sensitation, you know, when one generation may accept something, so that next generation embraces it. And that's generally how that goes. So maybe our, you know, our generation, the psychological, um, you know, is, is what's that the next group of uh, kids growing up and coming in, that they be desensitized to them and they've got to find something else to up the ante to get the shock value in the film. You know, the, the, the whole um, mechanics and uh, storytelling aspect of it to, to, to you know, really lure people into enjoy the story. Let me make a comment before you I want to, I want to uh, hit you guys uh, video games uh, thought. Because I'm going to tell you, I play video games not as much as the average gamer, but probably a little bit more than the average person, right? And I played them since Space Invaders, all the way back from the days, um, right, <laughs> to Metal Gear, to Halo, you know, to, to, to um, gosh, what was the one, Dead Space, kind of oh, was, the, was the one that was the scariest, but nothing to me has uh, been as traumatizing as when I used to go to the video store and get faces of death, right? You guys won't know anything about that. That was the okay. original. Uh, yeah, uh, right. Original and, and on faces of death, when the faces of death, I saw a person jump off a six-floor building and the body hit the ground. That was traumatizing to me. I also used to have to go to the store and rent a porno movie, right? <laughs> that is another level of trauma. But I say that because now I'm a school teacher. And when I send my students to Google search, they can get traumatized on the results of that Google search because violence 
extreme violence, 50 million times more than what you see in, in the most violent video game. You can Google it and in school with the strongest what are, uh, uh, blockers, right? You can still get a, a result that can traumatize you. Doesn't even have to be a video. I think the information era has done more to traumatize us and our young people to sex and violence because it used to have to be an older kid that said, hey, you wanna watch this porno movie? You know, see something like, now kids can do it innocently. You know, you can, you can do, you can Google legs. Something like non-sexual, right? And a porno something will pop up. So I think the information era and technology has done probably more to traumatize. I've never seen a movie with Mexican drug lords cutting somebody's body open. You know, that's horrible. Or even the, not even the intentional violence. Yeah, but at least you have to go see it. This one invades your home. It invades your cell phone. You know, you'll see a motorcycle accident, and you'll be watching it, and next thing you know, the camera passes by the guy's head inside the helmet. I saw a motorcycle, not to traumatize you, but just to show you how easy it is. I saw a motorcycle accident where the camera passed the dude's heart, and it was still beating outside of his chest. Holy moly. That's... That's more, at least when, when, when Hellraiser was out there, you had to go see it and it had warnings. You knew you were going to see something. This stuff comes at you sideways. I'm sorry, I took your comment. Sure. Um, just to add on to everything, it's just, uh, I come from a medical background, so um, seeing all this blood and gore and stuff like that, at this point, well, I'm sensitized just from having seen it in the field, in the field but now I'm just like, well, that's definitely excessive, like when someone gets their hand cut off and his blood is just spewing out and gallon. Well, like quick Tarantino ish. Yeah. <laughs> How do you have that much blood? Right. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's like it does have to be it, it's almost like the, the blood is like a, an apostrophe, you know, just to take it over the top. You know, but at least, you know, probably not this maybe even a better word than saying desensitized to it. And you were alluding to it when you were saying we've matured. You know, there's something to the fact that we actually seen real blood. And so now we have a basis of comparison. So now we, you know, we've been fully educated and made aware. So now we can put it into perspective. You know, so now when you see Kill Bill, you'll be like, oh, come on. You know, that's too much. Yes. Do you think that we should actually have more of a responsibility to actually respect the reality of some of this stuff that happens that this does happen to people and actually get, educate like the people we're responsible for on what actually happens, like what um, how traumatic these events could actually be and so, like this isn't something to be glorified. So I think, well, I think Jeff yeah. actually, his whole point that, that he was talking about, because we aim for realism and at one, at one time Realism was not a thing. I mean, we, we made something, and if it was made up, it was made up. But as we Everything matured, was fantasy. As we matured, yeah, yeah. now we want realism. So, like Jeff said, you can Google images, you can Google information, and it's right there. Because you can Google, and because filmmakers and creators know that you can Google this stuff, then it challenges them to make it more realistic. Uh, there's one particular thing that happened in two different shows that the first one, they, they were both so realistic that they weren't scared, they were expected. And that is in The Boys, when uh, the speech that ran to the guy's girlfriend and how she just kind of like disintegrated. When then Brightburn, the sheriff came to the door and he flew through the sheriff. And I don't know if you really paid attention, but you see off on the side where you know there's a bunch of guts and blood and stuff. He exploded. Well, we expect those things to happen because we're so knowledgeable that we know things coming at a high rate of speed under certain circumstances and 
certain conditions will cause certain things to happen. So if you got a guy running 100 miles per hour and you hit somebody and that person doesn't explode, and that person then just burst open, then you're like, man, that's not real. If you got a, a, a kid who's flying at a uh, uh, hypersonic speed that runs into a person or plows through a person and that person that disintegrated or exploded, then there's no realism in that. Forget that all of this is fantasy to start out with. But you still have to have that realistic outlook to that. It, there still has to be realism in the fantasy. So that that adds in the fantasy. There was a comment made about the responsibility of some of the stuff that's shown. Go back to Jaws. Mm -hmm. um, there was a beautiful documentary shown last night. Mm -hmm. The shark is still working. But uh, the filmmaker and the author now is actually speaking, goes around talking about oceanographic and concerns for the, the ocean and stuff like that because of that. As a result of the panic, the people not wanting to get in the water for sharks to demystify and actually tell the you know the real story behind the sharks. So the villain became becomes the hero, and the education ends up as, as a result of that. That's just it was an interesting follow-up to what you were saying. I tell people all the time in um, whenever I ask when I do a hard down, I talk about Jaws, I tell them you don't you miss it. It's like Frankenstein. What was Frankenstein about? Was it about the monster? Or is it about a doctor with a god complex? We're the monsters. Same thing with Jaws. In the beginning of Jaws, you'll hear them saying, oh, they're overfishing the shark's natural hunting grounds. So now sharks have to come closer to shore. And the apex predator, the big mama jamma outside of the orcas is the, is the great white. And that's what caused the great white. But you know, people gloss over that because it's so reflective of our time, you know, we don't really pay attention to it. And then by the time the shark is killing, you're like, oh my God, bad shark. No, the shark isn't bad. That's what sharks do. You understand? So you know, we're bad because we took away and uh, you know it's almost like we feel entitled to be able to fish. Let me get him and then I'm coming. Key two words to that, global warming. Oh, well, that's the villain now. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely two words. But overfishing is still, and, and, and that may not be global warming, that just means overpopulation. It's the same, the same principle. Like yes. Uh, going back to respect, actually, thank you for bringing that up because there's also the whole fact that they didn't respect the fact that that shark, that's his home, that's his area. Right. Stay away from him. <laughs> the what fact that... One of my comedians has a, a joke. Oh, that's because you probably live in you. You're in the military. I mean, for me, I every time I go on a cruise and go snorkeling, I'm like, I'm scared of sharks, you know. And it comes back. But the funny part, my one of my comedians, uh, Ian Edwards, a friend of mine, he had a joke. He said, hey, "There's no such thing as a surprise shark attack. If the shark attacks somebody on the beach." That's a surprise. <laughs> but you're in the water. You're in the air. And that's why it was not scary to you. That's why Jaws was not scary to you. We're talking about uh, a creature or animal in its natural habitat doing what it does naturally. It's like, who's really the crazy one here? You know this shark is out there getting continually go out there in the water. You are going to get that's probably because you don't swim. I like I, I, oh, 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 I like the true. ocean swimming. Definitely swimming. Definitely and we live we live on this peninsula where we got the bay and we got the ocean on on either side. So it's really hard to not get. Yeah, but I'm afraid to go in there for the pollution. The right. <laughs> and I'm from New Jersey where we had to pay five to ten dollars to get on any of our shores to be able to go to a beach for free. I'm like, I'm gonna go every week. When I first moved down here for the for first 10 years, I was at the beach at least two times a month. Go. I was gonna ask if you guys think of Jaws as a game changer in the horror genre because there was a, I remember seeing a documentary, it was um, the directors and another, I think the executive producer were, were watching the crowd's reaction to everything. And then to see where the boy gets eaten by the shark, uh, someone walked out. It was like, and they're like, oh no, our first walk out, who is gonna be terrible? But all he did was like, he just opened the door, threw up. And then went back to his seat. Uh, I, I I'll say I don't know if it 
certain things are full game changers because people and filmmakers try to do so many different things all the time. But I will say it was a big influence. And it had a lot of mimics. You know, they demonized sharks. Sharks weren't that demonized before Jaws, you know. They were things in the water. I mean, James Bond for the shark, Batman for the shark. You know, it was no more than a snake. You know, snakes will bite you, but it ain't that bad. People are tough. Me, you know, we got Shark Week, we got Sharknado, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got all of these. So I don't know if it was necessarily a game changer per se. It was a game changer for sharks because certainly people did get scared of it. I think uh, when you look at, at some of the earlier horror films and because society as a whole was not as informed as we are now. Uh, you had a movie, any movie that had anything to do with the occult or voodoo or something like that, you had a whole segment of the population who, that was terrified because they didn't know anything about voodoo, they didn't know anything about the occult. They'd never been exposed to it. So, uh, like for me growing up, one of the scariest movies to me was The Creature from the Black Moon. <laughs> now, the reason this movie was scary to me because when I was a kid, I could see the creature. I, I felt the creature was real. But the thing was the whole setting of it, like a black lagoon. They're in this lagoon and you got all these these people keep going out there in this lagoon and on these boats and coming up and pulling him underwater, walks up on the beach. I mean, this, that stuff was scary to me. I see it now and I laugh. Uh, after the Creature from the Black Lagoon, the next scariest thing actually was the episode of Star Trek. It was the episode of Star Trek where uh, they went on, uh, they went on this planet and they encountered the, I can't think of the creature. I, what I do remember the most about it was the fact that Spock couldn't be there. And it was scary that it was something that Spock couldn't be there. He was the superhero. Near, neither mentally or physically. If they could outpower and outplay Spock, then this has to be a scary thing. What you got? You uh, mentioned Jaws may or may not have been a game changer. It wasn't so much the uh, the shark part of Jaws being a game changer, but how they had to film it and what it turned into. You didn't see the monster or the shark until mm -hmm. almost 40 minutes to an hour into the film. It was all psychological. Right. It was all angles. It was all, and that's what revolutionized that type of filmmaking. Going back to, we don't really need the gore and the jump out. We need to psych you up and just let you fill in the blanks and you create the fear yourself because of the suspense that's built from just the, the, the water, you know, when you hear that music, you know something's going to happen. You didn't always see something. You just saw the hint of something. I think Friday the 13th was a bigger game changer. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, Not in a good way. That, that simply, simply because. Or simply, bigger influencer. You know, because I don't know about the game changer, but simply because even though there have been horror films and been slasher movies, you had a combination of they brought that occult in because the guy came back from the dead. Other slashers were people that were going around killing. You had a guy. So, would you consider Frankenstein a cult? Frank, I consider Frankenstein to be uh, biology gone wrong. Because I, it, it, I don't know. To, even, even, even under the circumstances in which it was written with Mary Shelley's creativity, it seemed so realistic. <laughs> Lightning, I can electric. go and put two bodies together. Science. You know, yeah. Yeah. Science, so, science. Weird so. science. Yes. Actually, to to go with the whole Frankenstein, even the book, it wasn't even any electrodes or electronics. He built the thing bit by bit. The whole thing, the whole Fra Frankenstein monster, he was, didn't even have a name. Right. Like, Never had a name. He constructed it from scratch, from material that he created to synthesize life. Like you said, he had a god complex. Yeah, he was god. He was uh, cemetery shopping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that I enjoy the whole message of that. It's the whole 
also with the occult, it's playing with stuff we don't know about. That actually one of our biggest fears, the unknown. And then when we have people who mess with it, who don't respect it, and all of a sudden they create something that's... What does all occult mean? Occult means it. So you have people who, when you, when you use the word occult, you really have an understanding of what that word means. If they aren't, they're like, hey, all I'm doing is I have information and knowledge that you don't have. That I went and I searched this out, and I know this, but it's not publicized mainstream. It's not talked about by everybody. So it's hidden. Yeah. You know what I say as a person who could be considered an occultist, right? Um, because, right? I think it is probably a, uh, a derogatory term used by um, uh, a base culture to uh, show hate on other cultures that believe in connectedness in ways that science can't prove. Um, because to say it's a cult, right, there's probably more people that believe in other things besides science than people that believe in science. And which came first? You know, so what would the people who believe in, I guess, you know, uh, what we call voodoo, right? You know, or Yoruba, religions, Santeria. You know, I live in Miami, so I got all of it. Even I learned the name for the one from Trinidad. You know, I can't remember it right now, but I did learn the name of it. Or what we, you know, know in the Salem witch hunts. You know, they were demonizing women for being able to tell when it came one month to the next month. And that's simple biology. But to call it something that is like the occult, it sounds, uh, first of all, cults aren't good, right? So we can agree that the root word is already not good. So when we say occult, you know, almost like of occult, you know, no, it's not another cult, it's another culture. It's a different culture. And, you know, as it's like- It's not even culturally, because the, the books of the Bible that have been left out, you know, we have- Well, it is to, to, to them. We have the Bible. All these other books that aren't included. The books that aren't included, when you talk theologically, are referred to as occult because they are hidden. Right, but that is the religion of Christianity outside of the Abrahamic religions. That's not the whole world's spiritual interpretations of life. We're on Native American land. They ain't got no Bible. They ain't believe in the missing books of the Bible. You know, so when we talk about Native American, they're not an occultist group of spiritual connected people. It's like Friday, I was supposed to go out to Tampa to a ceremony at one of the mounds, you know, a Native American pyramid, okay? It's, a, it's, it's related to the sun and the rotation. That's not a cult. That's actually science that we understand now. So, I mean, I understand what the Abrahamic religions may call that a cultish, you know, but Yoruba is an African religion. The Native Americans didn't even have religions. It was, just their spiritual interpretation of the sun, moon, and stars. So again, I don't know, and, and this is a, sort of a digression, but it's also important because it is kind of what becomes our default area of fear, you know, and it fuels, you know, I hate to mix politics in it, but then when we start talking about the people of these places, now we start to attach the demonization of their practices onto them, and thus they become scary. You know that, what I'm saying? No, that, which are, that which we do not understand, we can develop on. But and not always. You know what no, I'm saying? I like sushi. I haven't called it a cold <laughs> food. You understand know what I'm saying? Because I'm, mean, a, I, I'm a the Anthony Bourdain tribe. Right. I want to go out there and try the world's foods. But if we start talking culture, now we're saying, uh oh, that's an occult culture. I don't want to try that. Because now it puts me in question of my Abrahamic interpretation of spirituality. But I can eat their food, but I can't, <laughs> I can't experiment with their God or experiment with their way of interpreting nature. You understand? Okay, so we got 10 minutes. Um, I did want to run into some, some more stuff. We, but this was good. We were talking real hard. And I almost got to the point where I could say something real scary. Because I'm out. Yeah, I don't have no base. It's very hard to... 
the skin. Um, I wanted to talk about Razor Beam. Did you see it? Yeah. Okay. Have you all saw the Netflix show, Raising Dion? Oh my God. We're going to talk about it for a little bit, but then I'm going to find another uh, element that, that puts it into perspective. Um, what did you think about it? And then I'm going to tell, I'll let you go first, and then I'll follow you up. What did you think about the series? I thought the series was good. Uh, this year, I, I call this year the year of the superpower child. Right. Right. This, is the, this has been the year of the superpower child. I'm also watching on NBC Emergence. Anybody watching Emergence? If you're not watching it, it it's interesting. Uh, so many plane shows. crashes. Yes. And uh, the sheriff of the little town is out to investigate. And they find one survivor. It's a little good. I'm not going to spoil it anymore, but Emergence, check that out. Uh, we know the cast of Stranger Things. We talked about Brightburn. Uh, Raising Dion falls right right in along with that in that we have a child that has powers and we have a single mother who finds out that her child has powers and now we see what she does in order to keep the child safe. The, for me, the series was, I had, it was a must watch because I had confidence first. I'm confident. I am a comic book guy. I probably read every comic book to every movie first. Pacific Rim, for example. You read, yeah, but I digress. You read, read so, TMZ? Look. Okay. So, you have to read a comic book and knowing what the series was about. I think that, and it goes back to this desensitization that I was talking about, to see this child with these powers and doing things that if the child was like, Seven eight years old. So, uh, in one scene, one of his classmates takes his father's watch. He says, Give me, give me watch, give me watch. The child tries to run away and he telekinetically slams the child to a wall. Like, that's, what that's a mild do. spoiler. That, but that, it won't destroy that, 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 <laughs> That's what I would do. Right. But this is something that, you know, as she had to help, she has to help a child understand. Boundaries, perspectives, what you can and can't do, that type of thing. And at the same time, situations arise where she has to throw it up to So it, it's very interesting. It's, very, it's a very good scene. Um, what I like, there's a whole lot, you know, I wanted to talk about it more. The Joker stuff is good. We need to get into the Joker. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I like about Raising the Nine, being a person of color, a writer of color, it was a story that was multicultural, right? Um, and it didn't seem contrived. The uh, only element in it that felt a little contrived was the lesbian character uh, because it didn't have a purpose, right? Her being a lesbian didn't move the story. But I'm giving it 10.5 because they used an, a handicapped young lady in the story. I have not seen a handicapped person used so well, especially because of her handicap, she was limited to a wheelchair, and she played a significant role throughout the series. It was on the level of the war veteran in Pacific, um, in a battleship, where he had his amputated legs, um, but he, you, you didn't even know he had amputated legs because he operated and functioned without too much limitation. She had a lot of limitation. And then they had an Asian uh, woman in there who her, I don't like to say, oh, it didn't make a difference whether she was Asian or not, but she brought her Asian element to it. She acted very Asian in the way they interact in um, a multicultural environment. So I give, and then of course she had the racial, you know, black, white, that was, that was that, we, we know how to do that well now, at least now. You know, black person doesn't die at the end of the movie. You know, <laughs> or you don't kill a white person to make up for that, you know. So they did it good. So I think I like that element of it. And then, like you said, Dion took a while to grow on me, you know, um, but he certainly didn't go bright by. He had a better relationship with his single mom, and it was more of a, a realistic family. Although I'm not going to say bright bird wasn't unrealistic, it was just really not average. Right. They, they were a remote family. In Raising Dion, they were probably the average family. You know what I'm saying? D despite she being a widow, 
right? So I like that a lot. Um, next, um, we'll just make our closing comments because we are we are done here. Um, I, this is a uh, sci-fi uh, slide, but in terms of horror, um, what do you see? What are you excited about in, in coming out in horror? Whether it's a movie, a comic book, a novel, tell me. And then where can they meet you? We're going to be here for the rest of the convention, but what, you know. Well, as I said, I, I'm a comic book guy, so I, I'm strictly well, not strictly. I'm more so comfortable saying anything else. Uh, my friend Brad Lugol, I don't know if you ever heard of him, uh, he is actually creating the horror series line for NRP Press. Uh, the first couple of books that he's had come out, horror comics, uh, Leave on the Light. Four, and, book four now? Uh, three. Three. Yeah. Leave on the Light. Once a month, once a month. And then, um, uh, Layla and the ice cream truck, they're all done well. They've all ranked well and made with the mainstream of Com Comicron, which is their ranking system for comic books. Uh, his Leave on the Light series got in the top 50. The horror story, horror comics, is in the top 500. But he is creating the horror story our line for NRP Press. Uh, we also have a comic book together that will be coming out in NRP Press. This is the Zombie. I have issue one with me now, and issue two is in production. It'll be out next year. Um, as you see, I'm wearing mine. Um, this is a movie that I have coming out. I've, I've done a multi branded approach to making my name. Um, this movie is called The Death Pledge. It comes out in streaming platforms in late November around Thanksgiving, so please be on the lookout for it. Um, and it's sort of a game changer in the sense that, you know, um, I, before I knew Jordan Peele was coming out with the remake of Candyman, I had already wanted to give uh, the diverse community a character that they could be cosplay that wasn't a regular person. like. Candyman is my uncle with a hook hand. You know, <laughs> I wanted to give us a masked character. So this is Baba. I'll be cosplaying him. You can get the information. I have some comic books. Fifteen dollars. How much is yours? Ten. Ten. So you can check us after. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This is a. It, this was really good to be at the first uh, Phantasm. We look forward to having more of these. We've got good panels and good people coming through and celebrating horror without being scared of. You Where can we find you for the rest of the convention? Are you in the vendor room? Uh, I will be. I, okay. So, yeah, you can check in the vendor room, but come up and get uh, a card now for the death. Thank you.